Book Talk begins at 21 minutes and 5 seconds. Welcome to Craftlit. The podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 647, June Buggin in January. This episode of Craftlit is brought to you by our patrons at patreon.com slash craftlit. This week, we would like to thank Susan Cole, Julia, Madeline Daly, Janelle Serio, Mary Delaney, and our two brand new patrons, Dan Fay and Jen Rich. Welcome to a really happy little family. And thank you so very much. Couldn't do this without you. Well, hello, how are you? If you are watching on YouTube and this worked, you can see me, which is so weird. For almost 18 years, I have been recording the podcast just with a microphone and not with a camera. So this is completely new to me and life's an adventure. So I last week recorded that I was having a pretty good Tuesday and I continued to have a pretty good all the way through Friday. And then I did way too much last week. And so I kind of crashed over the weekend, but that's, that's okay. Cause I did nothing literally Saturday, Sunday, or Monday. I think I walked up the st- up and down the stairs a couple of times. Oh, because thing two turned 20. <laughs> yes, that is correct. So if that wasn't enough to, <laughs> to flatten me, woof. But be that as it may, I'm actually doing pretty well today so far. So I, I don't, want to jinx things and say that I'm on an upswing because I know there are going to be setbacks. That's just the nature of the long COVID beast. But, but I do feel like myself now, at least as often as I feel like not me. So I'll take that as a win, right? You got to take what you can get when you can get it. So today's episode is called June Bugging in January. Why would I call it that? Last week, in fact, right before the early Zoom on Tuesday morning, I caught a YouTube video while I was, I don't know, brushing my teeth or doing something useful. And the girl on the video, and I will link to these in the show notes, the girl on the video talked about June Bugging as a way of cleaning if you are ADHD and you know, with all the comorbidities that go along with that, depression and anxiety and, and then just ADHD brain scattering all over the place and printers going off in the background, it can be very hard to start a project that you didn't want to do in the first place, like cleaning your closet or reorganizing your closet or tidying your closet or just freaking putting clothes away some days. It can be hard to keep your brain focused on that thing because your brain is always going to be distracted, sometimes just by the thoughts that you think in your head and sometimes by things that you see around you. Like I'm, I'm at a point in life where if I am cooking something, and this actually started about, I, I know in retrospect, this started about 12 years ago, but I, I didn't really understand what was happening. If somebody comes into the kitchen while I'm cooking dinner, <laughs> been a long time since that's happened because I've been flat on my back. But, but if that had happened and someone had talked to me or worse, asked me a question, whether it had to do with what I was cooking or not, I had a mini panic attack because I knew for certain that I was not going to remember (laughs) where I was in the recipe or what I was doing and getting it back on track was going to be very, very difficult. And, and so I became the kind of like, I can't have you in the kitchen with me, leave. 
person. That same problem can happen when, like I said, addressing something that you probably didn't want to do in the first place, but that you know that you need to. It's the adulting thing, right? June bugging apparently, and I'm going to link out to all of this information for you from the show notes. Uh, June bugging apparently started off as a Tumblr post, which I thought was very cool because thing one and two are going to be very happy about that. And I'm looking to see if there's a date on it. It goes a way back. No, because Tumblr doesn't like dates. I know there's a reason for that, but it drives me nuts personally because of moments like this. Anyway, in the past, at some point, uh, someone named Jumping Jack Trash, which I just love, on Tumblr, was reposted by Umaru Speaks, also listed as The Hand Wixard, T-H-E-H-A-N-D-W-I-X-A-R-D dot Tumblr dot com. I love that, The Hand Wixer. That's just fun. They posted about this idea of June bugging. June bugging be like June bugs themselves are tenacious little beasties. They will cling to the screen and they may flail around and flop over and fall on the ground, but they will come back to the screen on a window or a screen door because they want in and because it's something important to hold on to. And they'll try and get in the house, sure, but it's the tenacity. Uh, for me, it's the tenacity, the visual tenacity of them holding on to the thing and coming back to the thing, no matter how many times they fall over on their back and squiggle around for a while. If I say out loud to myself, I am going to take all of my shoes out of the closet. I'm going to put shoes that I haven't worn in a year into a box for the thrift store, and I am going to put all of the shoes back in an order that will allow me to access them usefully, because right now it's winter time, so I'm not wearing my, my little ballet flats or anything like that. And any shoes that I can't find a match for, I'm going to put in a different box. And I take a big Sharpie marker with me, and I write on the box that these are missing something. I have a couple different boxes of missing something, question mark. One of them is tech supplies and one of them is shoes and socks where they're missing their partner. And I have to say, since I started doing this a couple years ago, I have found, <laughs> I have found socks that I liked, that I didn't want to throw away. And I felt so vindicated that I put it in the box labeled missing something and I found the missing sock. Again, it's a small win, but take what you can get. So this idea of June bugging, I think works because of the idea of tethering yourself to the task that you are going to do. It does not mean you will finish it all at once because you won't, but it does mean that you have a fighting chance of getting back to it. And, and this is super important, because brains, if you have already told yourself that you are going to be June bugging, that means that when you do inevitably get distracted and have to remind yourself to come back to the task at hand, you don't beat yourself up about it because that's what you were doing in the first place. You were just June bugging and it was going to take you a while to cycle back around until the thing was done, but eventually you get it done. And if you narrow the task down to something small enough that you can complete it in a day, you have won. The big tasks, the one that take more, more than a day, those are the ones that are really hard because again, my brain knows that if I walk away, if I get distracted, if I get interrupted, I will forget where I'm at. The solution I've been using for that is painter's tape and Sharpie markers. And so I will write myself sometimes little short stories that I attach to whatever it was that I was doing when I was doing it so that I know where I left the process in progress. The, you were putting these things here because reasons. I know for people who are 
lucky enough to be neurotypical, this must sound like I have lost my mind. But if you or a young person you know has a brain that is constantly stuffing information inside of it or generating ideas, this is standard. It's just, dude, it just is what happens. So June bugging. I am a huge fan. Uh, like I said, I'm linking out to the videos and the Tumblr post that originally talked about this. And I hope that that can help. That's actually one of the ways that we managed it. We, it was a collaborative effort here in the Ordover household. We managed to get the YouTube video up on Friday that for Heather's world blew up over the weekend. We had a feeling that it was going to get some play in the booktuber teacher tube world, but it blew quickly. I don't, it's never going to make a million views or anything like that. But if you haven't been following the cataclysmic release of H Bomber Guy's plagiarism video, and I think I mentioned this before as something to go watch, that it's, it is almost four hours long, but don't watch it all at once. You don't need to. You will need to stop and process and walk away and come back because he really, there is never a dull moment in that video, but there are lots of, ooh, I need to think about that moments. I mean, you, you can watch because it's fun and he and Kat are very, very good video makers. So it is entertaining, but it's something that you could listen to just as well. It is very hard as a teacher to explain to students why plagiarism is bad. They haven't gotten to, I mean, in high school, they haven't really gotten to a point where owning their brain and their thoughts is all that important to them. And depending on who they live with and who their friends are, there may not be a whole lot of praise in their life for having their own points of view and opinions about things. So that can also really get you into trouble or at least into sticky spaces when you're trying to teach kids how to not plagiarize. I thought that I kind of made some inroads when I was teaching by talking about it as theft. Nobody likes to have their things stolen. And when people put words onto a screen or onto paper and it is theirs and they are making it very clear that it is theirs like I by line by me my name wrote this thing for public consumption not public usage or theft having somebody steal that especially if it's your livelihood that is not good and my kids kind of grokked that but they didn't really necessarily emotionally get it because they hadn't said anything that anybody really was going to want to steal yet. You know what I mean? Like shoes, sure. If somebody jumped them for their shoes, they would be really ticked off. Totally get that. It takes a little bit longer than 15, 16, 17 to get to the point where you don't want somebody stealing your words or your ideas. And, and at the same time that this was happening, uh, the night before, we released the video and people who are on the Thursday Zoom call know I was trying to find a link to the opening and closing music for Craftlet because while the opening music by Joshua Christian, Chasing Hero, Sailing the Gale has been, it, I got it off of the Podsafe Audio Network or GarageBand, which is old GarageBand before there was Apple GarageBand. It was a website that had Podsafe audio that you could download. That's where I found our opening theme for Craftlet, which we've been using ever since. Somewhere around, what was it, episode 170, 270, something like that, I found the closing music that we've been using since then on the same site. And once we started uploading just the audio files of Craftlet episodes to YouTube, we started getting copyright claim dings because of that closing music. And so we now have a disclaimer on, on the videos moving forward that 
Helio, this song was acquired under a free license. We are giving credit to the author. I have tried to hunt him down online. I have failed. I don't know where he is. Some record company thinks that they own the music now. I don't have a clue. But I do know when and where I got the music. So while I was looking for a link to those songs to put into my description box at the bottom of the YouTube video, I found that Craftlit showed up on a website that is charging people, which is not okay. Craftlit's been distributed under a Creative Commons non-commercial license forever, meaning you are perfectly free to download this, to share it, to listen to it, to listen to it with other people, to send the mp3 file to other people to listen to. What you are not allowed to do is take what I put out as the audio podcast, and now video podcast sometimes, you are not allowed to take that and turn it into your own thing that you charge money for. It, that seems to make sense. So how this company hijacked my RSS feed and is now charging for Craftlet, I do not know. I am not the only podcaster that this is happening to on this particular site. I'm not going to mention the site's name yet because I actually have an intellectual property lawyer in the family and she is going to help me deal with this. If they want to compensate me for Craftlet, that's fine, but they can't just steal Craftlet. So it's been kind of an interesting weekend with a lot, a lot more going on than should have been going on for somebody who really needed to stay unplugged and quiet. But I got lucky that we June bugged our way through finishing the video. Aiden, thing two, did all of the editing. Thank you, Aiden. Which Aiden actually got comments in the comments praising the editing, which was awfully nice and certainly made their birthday a happy one. And yeah, so we now have over a thousand subscribers on Craftlet, which I know in the grand scheme of YouTube is like small potatoes. I don't care. That's really exciting. It does mean that there are more things that we're going to be able to do on YouTube now for you in combination with Patreon and other things. So yeah, big, big, huge win for all of us. Lovely, lovely comments. 98.9% .9 of the comments have been lovely and some of them very thoughtful. And a couple of the people you're going to wind up hearing on a Craftlit episode because they really sparked joy <laughs> to Marie Kondo human people. They really made me very happy with some of their comments. And so you may get to hear some awesomeness from them in the future, which I love. I love, you know me, I love finding interesting and I love finding awesome. And I also love finding kind and generous and sharing ness the sharing nissitude <laughs> yeah i'm just gonna keep making up words you can't stop me anyway has nothing to do with the three musketeers however laura ricketts sent me a marvelous podcast which will be linked to in the show notes it's a podcast called the rest is history you may already be listening to them they did an episode on the man in the iron mask which is fascinating and if I haven't made it clear before, I am making it clear now. The Three Musketeers is the first book in a multi-book series. And some of the books are tied together more closely, uh, Three Musketeers and the Four Musketeers being the obvious one. Uh, but it goes all the way up through The Man in the Iron Mask, where D'Artagnan is one of the, the main characters in, in the book, at least in the beginning of the book. And then there's the, the mystery surrounding the man in the iron mask. And as we already know from Alexandre Dumas, he is perfectly capable of taking real life human people and taking their story and either morphing it to his own storytelling needs or taking people's names and just using the names because he liked them 
or taking actual stories like John Felton and finding a way to fit it into his particular narrative. The Man in the Iron Mask is interesting. We are not going to do that as our next book because we need a break from the swashbuckly, adventure-y stuff. And this week's newsletter will announce what our next book is going to be. Uh, and I hope you are happy. And if everything goes well, I will also be releasing on the premium feed on the Craftlit app and the Walter Hartwright level and above on Patreon a very, very short little novella during the break while I'm prepping full-time for, for our next book. I have ordered all the biographies that I could find and several other things. So I'm, I'm ramping up the research for you guys because I am finally back at a place where I feel like I can read, at least on paper. Screens are still tricky, but paper I can do. So today's chapters. Today we are doing chapter 63 and 64. And if you recall, we just had Rochefort speaking with Milady, and they've hatched their plot for how they are going to A, get her to safety, and B, deal with Constance Bonancier. And, and that's great. Today, we have two, two chapters that they're very interesting to me. And it's interesting to me that they're back to back. And it's interesting to me that they are so close to the end of the book. I mean, it all makes sense. It's not like it's a curiosity. It'll, it'll all make sense in the wash. But the, the first chapter today, the drop of water is a very quiet chapter with some of the best manipulative dialogue ever subtle subtle and smart where just like when milady was kind of sparring with de winter or manipulating felton you could really see the cogs and wheels in her brain as they were working you're going to have that same experience with today's chapters and and there are several things i'll talk with you about on the, on the flip side but just there isn't a whole lot to prep you with except to say listen very closely like this is actually probably a chapter where you don't want to be knitting lace you know what I mean doing the dishes is probably okay but expect to take pauses because you're gonna want to rewind and and say did I really is that really what she said and the answer is probably yes yes it is and did she really do that yes Yes, she really did. So that's that's going to be the bulk of our chapters today. The The first one called A Drop of Water or The Drop of Water is longer. The second chapter is much, much shorter, and it's called The Man in the Red Cloak. And it is one of the times when Dumas, I don't want to say he's being cagey, but he is he is absolutely working hard to not use specific words and it's it's not like he's trying to hide anything it's almost like he's trying to protect our delicate sensibilities he'll get over that but not in today's chapter so yeah listen closely to what is and what is not being said in our second chapter today chapter 64 also remember that natural science, like we go back to Victor Frankenstein time, a study of natural science would be what we consider a study of biology. And that's all. And uh, that's it. All right, let's listen to chapters 63 and 64. We're almost there. 63 and 64 of The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas. If you are listening to a different version of the story, you can skip ahead to one hour, nine minutes and four seconds. All right, here we go. Chapter 63 of the D'Artagnan Romances, Volume 1, The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas, translated by William Robson. The Drop of Water Rochefort had scarcely departed when Madame Bonacieux re-entered. 
she found Milady with a smiling countenance. "'Well,' said the young woman, "'what you dreaded has happened. This evening or tomorrow the cardinal will send someone to take you away.' "'Who told you that, my dear?' asked Milady. "'I heard it from the mouth of the messenger himself.' "'Come and sit down close to me,' said Milady. "'Here I am. Wait till I assure myself that nobody hears us. "'Why all these precautions? You shall know.' Milady arose, went to the door, opened it, looked in the corridor, and then returned and seated herself close to Madame Bonacieux. "'Then,' said she, "'he has well played his part.' Who has? He who just now presented himself to the abbess as a messenger from the cardinal. It was then a part he was playing? Yes, my child. That man, then, was not? That man, said Milady, lowering her voice, is my brother. Your brother? cried Madame Bonacieux. No one must know this secret, my dear, but yourself. If you reveal it to any one in the world, I shall be lost, and perhaps yourself likewise. Oh, my God! Listen, this is what has happened. My brother, who was coming to my assistance to take me away by force if it were necessary, met with the emissary of the cardinal, who was coming in search of me. He followed him. At a solitary and retired part of the road he drew his sword, and required the messenger to deliver up to him the papers of which he was the bearer. The messenger resisted. My brother killed him. Oh, said Madame Bonachieux, shuddering. Remember, that was the only means. Then my brother determined to substitute cunning for force. He took the papers and presented himself here as the emissary of the cardinal and in an hour or two a carriage will come to take me away by the orders of his eminence. I understand. It is your brother who sends this carriage? Exactly. But that is not all. That letter you have received, and which you believe to be from Madame de Chevreuse? Well, it is a forgery. How can that be? Yes, a forgery. It is a snare to prevent your making any resistance when they come to fetch you. But it is D'Artagnan that will come. Do not deceive yourself. D'Artagnan and his friends are detained at the siege of La Rochelle. How do you know that? My brother met some emissaries of the cardinal in the uniform of musketeers. You would have been summoned to the gate. You would have believed yourself about to meet friends. You would have been abducted and conducted back to Paris. Oh, my God! My senses fail me amid such a chaos of iniquities. I feel if this continues, said Madame Bonacieux, raising her hands to her forehead, I shall go mad. Stop. What? I hear a horse's steps. It is my brother setting off again. I should like to offer him a last salute. Come. Milady opened the window and made a sign to Madame Bonacieux to join her. The young woman complied. Rochefort passed at a gallop. Adieu, brother, cried Milady. The chevalier raised his head, saw the two young women, and without stopping, waved his hand in a friendly way to Milady. The good George, said she, closing the window with an expression of countenance full of affection and melancholy and she resumed her seat as if plunged in reflections entirely personal. "'Dear lady,' said Madame Bonacieux, "'pardon me for interrupting you, but what do you advise me to do? Good heaven! You have more experience than I have. Speak. I will listen.' "'In the first place,' said Milady, "'it is possible I may be deceived, and that D'Artagnan and his friends may really come to your assistance.' "'Oh!' "'That would be too much,' cried Madame Bonacieux. "'So much happiness is not in store for me.' "'Then you comprehend it would be only a question of time, "'a sort of race which should arrive first. "'If your friends are the more speedy, you are to be saved. "'If the satellites of the cardinal, you are lost.' "'Oh, 
yes yes lost beyond redemption what then to do what to do there would be a very simple means very natural tell me what to wait concealed in the neighborhood and assure yourself who are the men who come to ask for you but where can i wait oh there is no difficulty in that i shall stop and conceal myself a few leagues hence until my brother can rejoin me well i take you with me we conceal ourselves and wait together but i shall not be allowed to go i am almost a prisoner as they believe that i go in consequence of an order from the cardinal no one will believe you anxious to follow me well well the carriage is at the door you bid me adieu you mount the step to embrace me a last time my brother's servant who comes to fetch me is told how to proceed he makes a sign to the postilion and we set off at a gallop but d'artagnan d'artagnan if he comes shall we not know it how nothing easier we will send my brother's servant back to bethune whom as i told you we can trust he shall assume a disguise and place himself in front of the convent if the emissaries of the cardinal arrive he will take no notice if it is monsieur d'artagnan and his friends he will bring them to us he knows them then doubtless has he not seen monsieur d'artagnan at my house oh yes yes you are right thus all may go well all may be for the best but we do not go far from this place seven or eight leagues at the most we will keep on the frontiers for instance and at the first alarm we can leave france and what can we do there wait but if they come my brother's carriage will be here first if i should happen to be any distance from you when the carriage comes for you at dinner or supper for instance do one thing what is that tell your good superior that in order that we may be as much together as possible you ask her permission to share my repast will she permit it what inconvenience can it be oh delightful in this way we shall not be separated for an instant well go down to her then to make your request i feel my head a little confused i will take a turn in the garden go and where shall i find you here in an hour here in an hour oh you are so kind and i am so grateful how can i avoid interesting myself for one who is so beautiful and so amiable are you not the beloved of one of my best friends dear d'artagnan oh how he will thank you i hope so now then all is agreed let us go down you are going into the garden yes go along this corridor down a little staircase and you are in it excellent thank you and the two women parted exchanging charming smiles milady had told the truth her head was confused for her ill-arranged plans clashed one another like chaos she required to be alone that she might put her thoughts a little into order she saw vaguely the future but she stood in need of a little silence and quiet to give all her ideas as yet confused a distinct form and a regular plan what was most pressing was to get madame bonacieux away and convey her to a place of safety and there if matters required make her a hostage milady began to have doubts of the issue of this terrible duel in which her enemies showed as much perseverance as she did animosity besides she felt as we feel when a storm is coming on that this issue was near and could not fail to be terrible the principal thing for her then was as we have said to keep madame bonacieux in her power madame bonacieux was the very life of d'artagnan this was more than his life the life of the woman he loved this was in case of ill fortune a means of temporizing and obtaining good conditions now this point was settled madame bonacieux without any suspicion accompanied her once concealed with her at armentieres 
it would be easy to make her believe that d'artagnan had not come to bethune in fifteen days at most rochefort would be back besides during that fifteen days she would have time to think how she could best avenge herself on the four friends she would not be weary thank god for she should enjoy the sweetest pastime such events could accord a woman of her character perfecting a beautiful vengeance resolving all this in her mind she cast her eyes around her and arranged the topography of the garden in her head milady was like a good general who contemplates at the same time victory and defeat and who is quite prepared according to the chances of the battle to march forward or to beat a retreat at the end of an hour she heard a soft voice calling her it was madame bonacieux the good abbess had naturally consented to her request and as a commencement they were to sup together on reaching the courtyard they heard the noise of a carriage which stopped at the gate milady listened do you hear anything said she yes the rolling of a carriage it is the one my brother sends for us oh my god come come courage the bell of the convent gate was sounded milady was not mistaken go to your chamber said she to madame bonacieux you have perhaps some jewels you would like to take i have his letters said she well go and fetch them and come to my apartment we will snatch some supper we shall perhaps travel part of the night and we must keep up our strength great god said madame bonacieux placing her hand upon her bosom my heart beats so i cannot walk courage courage remember that in a quarter of an hour you will be safe and think that what you are about to do is for his sake yes yes everything for him you have restored my courage by a single word go i will rejoin you milady ran up to her apartment quickly she there found rochefort's lackey and gave him his instructions he was to wait at the gate if by chance the musketeer should appear the carriage was to set off as fast as possible pass around the convent and go and wait for milady at a little village which was situated at the other side of the wood in this case milady would cross the garden and gain the village on foot as we have already said milady was admirably acquainted with this part of france if the musketeers did not appear things were to go on as had been agreed madame bonacieux was to get into the carriage as if to bid her adieu and she was to take away madame bonacieux madame bonacieux came in and to remove all suspicion if she had any milady repeated to the lackey before her the latter part of her instructions milady asked some questions about the carriage it was a chaise drawn by three horses driven by a postillion rochefort's lackey would precede it as courier milady was wrong in fearing that madame bonacieux would have any suspicion the poor young woman was too pure to suppose that any female could be guilty of such perfidy besides the name of the comtesse de winter which she had heard the abbess pronounced was wholly unknown to her and she was even ignorant that a woman had had so great and so fatal a share in the misfortune of her life you see said she when the lackey had gone out everything is ready the abbess suspects nothing and believes that i am taken by order of the cardinal this man goes to give his last orders take the least thing drink a finger of wine and let us be gone yes said madame bonacieux mechanically yes let us be gone milady made her a sign to sit down opposite poured her a small glass of spanish wine and helped her to the wing of a chicken see said she if everything does not second us here is night coming on by daybreak we shall have reached our retreat and nobody can guess where we are come courage take something madame bonacieux ate a few mouthfuls mechanically and just touched the glass with her lips come come said milady lifting hers to her mouth do as i do but at the moment the glass touched her lips her hand remained suspended she heard something on the road which sounded like the rattling of a distant gallop then it grew nearer and it seemed to her almost at the same time that she heard the neighing of horses this noise acted upon her joy like the storm which awakens the sleeper in the midst of a happy dream she grew pale and ran to the window while madame bonacieux 
rising all in a tremble, supported herself upon her chair to avoid falling. Nothing was yet to be seen. Only they heard the galloping draw nearer. "'Oh, my God!' said Madame Bonacieux. "'What is that noise?' "'That of either our friends or our enemies,' said Milady with her terrible coolness. "'Stay where you are. I will tell you.' Madame Bonacieux remained standing, mute, motionless, and pale as a statue. The noise became louder. The horses could not be more than a hundred and fifty paces distant. If they were not yet to be seen, it was because the road made an elbow. The noise became so distinct that the horses might be counted by the rattle of their hooves. Milady gazed with all the power of her attention. It was just light enough for her to see who was coming. All at once, at the turning of the road, she saw the glitter of laced hats and the waving of feathers. She counted two, then five, then eight horsemen. One of them preceded the rest by double the length of his horse. Milady uttered a stifled groan. In the first horseman she recognized D'Artagnan. "'Oh, my God, my God!' cried Madame Bonacieux. "'What is it?' "'It is the uniform of the Cardinal's guards. Not an instant to be lost. Fly, fly!' "'Yes, yes, let us fly!' repeated Madame Bonacieux, but without being able to make a step glued as she was to the spot by terror. They heard the horsemen pass under the windows. "'Come, then, come, then!' cried Milady, trying to drag the young woman along by the arm. "'Thanks to the garden, we yet can flee. I have the key, but make haste. In five minutes it will be too late.' Madame Bonacieux tried to walk, made two steps, and sank upon her knees. Milady tried to raise and carry her, but could not do it. At this moment they heard the rolling of the carriage, which at the approach of the musketeers set off at a gallop. Then three or four shots were fired. "'For the last time, will you come?' cried Milady. "'Oh, my God, my God! You see my strength fails me. You see plainly I cannot walk. Flee alone!' flee alone and leave you here no no never cried milady all at once she paused a livid flash darted from her eyes she ran to the table emptied into madame bonacieux's glass the contents of a ring which she opened with singular quickness it was a grain of a reddish color which dissolved immediately then taking the glass with a firm hand she said drink this wine will give you strength drink and she put the glass to the lips of the young woman who drank mechanically this is not the way that i wish to avenge myself said milady replacing the glass upon the table with an infernal smile but my faith we do what we can and she rushed out of the room madame bonacieux saw her go without being able to follow her she was like people who dream they are pursued and who in vain try to walk a few moments passed a great noise was heard at the gate. Every instant Madame Bonacieux expected to see Milady, but she did not return. Several times, with terror, no doubt, the cold sweat burst from her burning brow. At length she heard the grating of the hinges of the opening gates. The noise of boots and spurs resounded on the stairs. There was a great murmur of voices which continued to draw near, amid which she seemed to hear her own name pronounced. All at once, she uttered a loud cry of joy and darted toward the door. She had recognized the voice of D'Artagnan. "'D'Artagnan! D'Artagnan!' cried she. "'Is it you? This way! This way!' "'Constance! Constance!' replied the young man. "'Where are you? Where are you? My God!' At the same moment the door of the cell yielded to a shock. Rather than opened, several men rushed into the chamber. Madame Bonacieux had sunk into an armchair without the power of moving. D'Artagnan threw down a yet smoking pistol, which he held in his hand, and fell on his knees before his mistress. Athos replaced his in his belt. Porthos and Aramis, who held their drawn swords in their hands, returned them to their scabbards. "'Oh, D'Artagnan, my beloved D'Artagnan, you have come then at last. You have not deceived me. It is indeed thee.' "'Yes.' yes constance reunited oh it was in vain she told me you would not come i hoped in silence i was not willing to fly oh i have done well how happy i am 
At this word, she, Athos, who had seated himself quietly, started up. She? What she? asked D'Artagnan. Why, my companion, she who out of friendship for me wished to take me from my persecutors, she who, mistaking you for the cardinal's guards, has just fled away. Your companion? cried D'Artagnan, becoming more pale than the white veil of his mistress. Of what companion are you speaking, dear Constance? Of her whose carriage was at the gate, of a woman who calls herself your friend, of a woman to whom you have told everything. Her name, her name, cried D'Artagnan. My God, can you not remember her name? Yes, it was pronounced in my hearing once. Uh, stop, but it is very strange. Oh, my God. My head s swims. I cannot see. Help, help, my friends. Her hands are icy cold, cried D'Artagnan. She is ill. Great God, she is losing her senses. While Porthos was calling for help with all the power of his strong voice, Aramis ran to the table to get a glass of water, but he stopped at seeing the horrible alteration that had taken place in the countenance of Athos, who, standing before the table, his hair rising from his head, his eyes fixed in stupor, was looking at one of the glasses, and appeared a prey to the most horrible doubt. Oh, said Athos, oh, no, it is impossible. God would not permit such a crime. Water, water, cried D'Artagnan, water. Oh, poor woman, poor woman murmured Athos in a broken voice. Madame Bonacieux opened her eyes under the kisses of D'Artagnan. "'She revives!' cried the young man. "'Oh, my God, my God, I thank thee!' "'Madame,' said Athos, "'Madame, in the name of heaven, whose empty glass is this?' "'Mine, monsieur,' said the young woman in a dying voice. "'But who poured the wine for you?' that was in this glass. She. But who is she? Oh, I remember, said Madame Bonacieux, the Comtesse de Winter. The four friends uttered one and the same cry, but that of Athos dominated all the rest. At that moment, the countenance of Madame Bonacieux became livid. A fearful agony pervaded her frame, and she sank panting into arms of Porthos and Aramis. D'Artagnan seized the hands of Athos with an anguish difficult to be described. "'And what do you believe?' His voice was stifled by sobs. "'I believe everything,' said Athos, biting his lips till the blood sprang to avoid sighing. "'D'Artagnan! D'Artagnan!' cried Madame Bonacieux. "'Where art thou?' Do not leave me. You see, I am dying. D'Artagnan released the hands of Athos, which he still held clasped in both his own, and hastened to her. Her beautiful face was distorted with agony. Her glassy eyes had no longer their sight. A convulsive shuddering shook her whole body. The sweat rolled from her brow. In the name of heaven, run, call! Aramis, Porthos, call for help! Useless, said Athos, useless. For the poison which she pours, there is no antidote. Yes, yes, help, help, murmured Madame Bonacieux. Help! Then, collecting all her strength, she took the head of the young man between her hands, looked at him for an instant as if her whole soul passed into that look, and with a sobbing cry pressed her lips to his. "'Constance! Constance!' cried D'Artagnan. A sigh escaped from the mouth of Madame Bonacieux, and dwelt for an instant on the lips of D'Artagnan. That sigh was the soul, so chaste and so loving, which reascended to heaven. D'Artagnan pressed nothing but a corpse in his arms. The young man uttered a cry, and fell by the side of his mistress as pale and as icy as herself. Porthos wept. Aramis pointed toward heaven. 
Athos made the sign of the cross. At that moment a man appeared in the doorway almost as pale as those in the chamber. He looked around him and saw Madame Bonacieux dead, and D'Artagnan in a swoon. He appeared just at that moment of stupor which follows great catastrophes. "'I was not deceived,' said he. "'Here is Monsieur d'Artagnan, and you are his friends, Messieurs Athos, Porthos, and Aramis.' The persons whose names were thus pronounced looked at the stranger with astonishment. It seemed to all three that they knew him. "'Gentlemen,' resumed the newcomer, "'you are as I am, in search of a woman who,' added he with a terrible smile, "'must have passed this way, for I see a corpse.' The three friends remained mute, for although the voice as well as the countenance reminded them of someone they had seen, they could not remember under what circumstances. "'Gentlemen,' continued the stranger, "'since you do not recognize a man who probably owes his life to you twice, I must name myself. I am Lord de Winter, brother-in-law of that woman.' The three friends uttered a cry of surprise. Athos rose, and offering him his hand, "'Be welcome, my lord,' said he. "'You are one of us.' "'I set out five hours after her from Portsmouth,' said Lord de Winter. "'I arrived three hours after her at Boulogne. I missed her by twenty minutes at St. Omer. Finally, at Lilliers, I lost all trace of her. I was going about at random inquiring of everybody when I saw you gallop past.' I recognized Monsieur d'Artagnan. I called to you, but you did not answer me. I wished to follow you, but my horse was too much fatigued to go at the same pace with yours. And yet it appears, in spite of all your diligence, you have arrived too late. You see, said Athos, pointing to Madame Bonacieux, dead, and to d'Artagnan, whom Porthos and Aramis were trying to recall to life, "'Are they both dead?' asked Lord de Winter sternly. "'No,' replied Athos. "'Fortunately, Monsieur d'Artagnan has only fainted.' "'Ah, indeed, so much the better,' said Lord de Winter. At that moment d'Artagnan opened his eyes. He tore himself from the arms of Porthos and Aramis and threw himself like a madman on the corpse of his mistress. Athos rose, walked toward his friend with a slow and solemn step, embraced him tenderly, and as he burst into violent sobs, he said to him with his noble and persuasive voice, "'Friend, be a man. Women weep for the dead. Men, avenge them.' "'Oh, yes,' cried D'Artagnan. "'Yes, if it be to avenge her, I am ready to follow you.' Athos profited by this moment of strength which the hope of vengeance restored to his unfortunate friend to make a sign to Porthos and Aramis to go and fetch the superior. The two friends met her in the corridor. Greatly troubled and much upset by such strange events, she called some of the nuns who, against all monastic custom, found themselves in the presence of five men. "'Madame,' said Athos, passing his arm under that of D'Artagnan, we abandon to your pious care the body of that unfortunate woman. She was an angel on earth before being an angel in heaven. Treat her as one of your sisters. We will return some day to pray over her grave. D'Artagnan concealed his face in the bosom of Athos and sobbed aloud. Weep, said Athos. Weep, heart full of love, youth, and life. Alas, would I could weep like you. And he drew away his friend, as affectionate as a father, as consoling as a priest, noble as a man who has suffered much. All five, followed by their lackeys, leading their horses, took their way to the town of Bethune, whose outskirts they perceived, and stopped before the first inn they came to. But, said D'Artagnan, shall we not pursue that woman? Later said Athos. I have measures to take. She will escape us, replied the young man. She will escape us, and it will be your fault, Athos. 
"'I will be accountable for her,' said Athos. D'Artagnan had so much confidence in the word of his friend that he lowered his head and entered the inn without reply. Porthos and Aramis regarded each other, not understanding this assurance of Athos. Lord de Winter believed he spoke in this manner to soothe the grief of D'Artagnan. "'Now, gentlemen,' said Athos, when he had ascertained there were five chambers free in the hotel, "'let everyone retire to his own apartment. D'Artagnan needs to be alone, to weep and to sleep. I take charge of everything. Be easy.' "'It appears, however,' said Lord de Winter, "'if there are any measures to take against the Countess, it concerns me. She is my sister-in-law.' "'And me?' said Athos. She is my wife. D'Artagnan smiled, for he understood that Athos was sure of his vengeance when he revealed such a secret. Porthos and Aramis looked at each other and grew pale. Lord de Winter thought Athos was mad. Now retire to your chambers, said Athos, and leave me to act. You must perceive that in my quality of a husband this concerns me. Only D'Artagnan, if you have not lost it, give me the paper which fell from that man's hat, upon which is written the name of the village of— Ah, said D'Artagnan, I comprehend that name written in her hand. You see, then, said Athos, there is a God in heaven still. End of chapter 63 Chapter 64 of the D'Artagnan Romances, Volume 1 the Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas, translated by William Robson. The Man in the Red Cloak The despair of Athos had given place to a concentrated grief, which only rendered more lucid the brilliant mental faculties of that extraordinary man. Possessed by one single thought, that of the promise he had made and of the responsibility he had taken, he retired last to his chamber begged the host to procure him a map of the province, bent over it, examined every line traced upon it, perceived that there were four different roads from Bethune to Armentiera, and summoned the lackeys. Planchet, Grimaud, Bazin, and Mousqueton presented themselves, and received clear, positive, and serious orders from Athos. They must set out the next morning at daybreak, and go to Armentiera, each by a different route. Planchet, the most intelligent of the four, was to follow that by which the carriage had gone upon which the four friends had fired, and which was accompanied, as may be remembered, by Rochefort's servant. Athos set the lackeys to work first, because, since these men had been in the service of himself and his friends, he had discovered in each of them different and essential qualities. Then, lackeys who ask questions inspire less mistrust than masters, and meet with more sympathy among those to whom they address themselves. Besides, Milady knew the masters and did not know the lackeys. On the contrary, the lackeys knew Milady perfectly. All four were to meet the next day at eleven o'clock. If they had discovered Milady's retreat, three were to remain on guard. The fourth was to return to Bethune in order to inform Athos and serve as a guide to the four friends. These arrangements made the lackeys retired. Athos then rose from his chair, girded on his sword, enveloped himself in his cloak, and left the hotel. It was nearly ten o'clock. At ten o'clock in the evening, it is well known, the streets in provincial towns are very little frequented. Athos, nevertheless, was visibly anxious to find someone of whom he could ask a question. At length he met a belated passenger, went up to him, and spoke a few words to him. The man he addressed recoiled with terror, and only answered the few words of the musketeer by pointing. Athos offered the man half a pistole to accompany him, but the man refused. Athos then plunged into the street. The man had indicated with his finger, but arriving at four crossroads, he stopped again, visibly embarrassed. Nevertheless, as the crossroads offered him a better chance than any other place of meeting somebody, he stood still. In a few minutes a night watch passed. Athos repeated to him the same question he had asked the first person he met. The night watch evinced the same terror, refused in his turn to accompany Athos, and only pointed with his hand to the road he was to take. Athos walked in the direction indicated, and reached the suburb situated at the opposite extremity of the city, 
from that by which he and his friends had entered it. There he again appeared uneasy and embarrassed, and stopped for the third time. Fortunately, a mendicant passed, who, coming up to Athos to ask charity, Athos offered him half a crown to accompany him where he was going. The mendicant hesitated at first, but at the sight of the piece of silver which shone in the darkness he consented and walked on before Athos. Arrived at the angle of a street, he pointed to a small house, isolated, solitary, and dismal. Athos went toward the house, while the mendicant, who had received his reward, left as fast as his legs could carry him. Athos went round the house, before he could distinguish the door, amid the red color in which the house was painted. No light appeared through the chinks of the shutters, no noise gave reason to believe that it was inhabited. It was dark and silent as the tomb. Three times Athos knocked without receiving an answer. At the third knock, however, steps were heard inside. The door at length was opened, and a man appeared of high stature, pale complexion, and black hair and beard. Athos and he exchanged some words in a low voice. Then the tall man made a sign to the musketeer that he might come in. Athos immediately profited by the permission, and the door was closed behind him. The man whom Athos had come so far to seek, and whom he had found with so much trouble, introduced him into his laboratory, where he was engaged in fastening together with iron wire the dry bones of a skeleton. All the frame was adjusted except the head which lay on the table. All the rest of the furniture indicated that the dweller in this house occupied himself with the study of natural science. There were large bottles filled with serpents, ticketed according to their species. Dried lizards shone like emeralds set in great squares of black wood, and bunches of wild odoriferous herbs, doubtless possessed of virtues unknown to common men, were fastened to the ceiling and hung down in the corners of the apartment. There was no family, no servant. The tall man alone inhabited this house. Athos cast a cold and indifferent glance upon the objects we have described, and at the invitation of him whom he came to seek sat down near him. Then he explained to him the cause of his visit, and the service he required of him. But scarcely had he expressed his request when the unknown, who remained standing before the musketeer, drew back with signs of terror and refused. Then Athos took from his pocket a small paper, on which two lines were written, accompanied by a signature and a seal, and presented them to him who had made too prematurely these signs of repugnance. The tall man had scarcely read these lines, seen the signature, and recognized the seal, when he bowed to denote that he had no longer any objection to make, and that he was ready to obey. Athos required no more. He arose, bowed, went out, returned by the same way he came, re-entered the hotel, and went to his apartment. At daybreak D'Artagnan entered the chamber and demanded what was to be done. "'To wait,' replied Athos. Some minutes after, the superior of the convent sent to inform the musketeers that the burial would take place at midday. As to the poisoner, they had heard no tidings of her whatever, only that she must have made her escape through the garden, on the sand of which her footsteps could be traced, and the door of which had been found shut. As to the key, it had disappeared. At the hour appointed, Lord de Winter and the four friends repaired to the convent. The bells tolled, the chapel was open, the grating of the choir was closed. In the middle of the choir, the body of the victim, clothed in her novitiate dress, was exposed. On each side of the choir and behind the gratings opening to the convent, was assembled the whole community of the Carmelites, who listened to the divine service, and mingled their chant with the chant of priests, without seeing the profane or being seen by them. At the door of the chapel D'Artagnan felt his courage fall anew, and returned to look for Athos, but Athos had disappeared. Faithful to his mission of vengeance, Athos had requested to be conducted to the garden, and there upon the sand, following the light steps of this woman, who left sharp tracks wherever she went, he advanced toward the gate which led into the wood, and causing it to be opened, he went out into the forest. Then all his suspicions were confirmed. The road by which the carriage had disappeared encircled the forest. 
Athos followed the road for some time, his eyes fixed upon the ground. Slight stains of blood, which came from the wound inflicted upon the man who accompanied the carriage as a courier, or from one of the horses, dotted the road. At the end of three-quarters of a league, within fifty paces of Festibert, a larger bloodstain appeared. The ground was trampled by horses. Between the forest and this accursed spot, a little behind the trampled ground, was the same track of small feet as in the garden. The carriage had stopped here. At this spot Milady had come out of the wood and entered the carriage. Satisfied with this discovery, which confirmed all his suspicions, Athos returned to the hotel and found Planchet impatiently waiting for him. Everything was as Athos had foreseen. Planchet had followed the road like Athos. He had discovered the stains of blood. Like Athos, he had noted the spot where the horses had halted. But he had gone farther than Athos, for at the village of Festibert, while drinking at an inn, he had learned without needing to ask a question that the evening before, at half-past eight, a wounded man who accompanied a lady traveling in a post-chaise had been obliged to stop, unable to go further. The accident was set down to the account of robbers who had stopped the chaise in the wood. The man remained in the village. The woman had had a relay of horses and continued her journey. Planchet went in search of the postillion who had driven her and found him. He had taken the lady as far as Fromella, and from Fromella she had set out for Armentiera. Planchet took the crossroad, and by seven o'clock in the morning he was at Armentiera. There was but one tavern, the post. Planchet went and presented himself as a lackey out of a place who was in search of a situation. He had not chatted ten minutes with the people of the tavern before he learned that a woman had come there alone about eleven o'clock the night before, had engaged a chamber, had sent for the master of the hotel, and told him she desired to remain some time in the neighborhood. Planchet had no need to learn more. He hastened to the rendezvous, found the lackeys at their posts, placed them as sentinels at all the outlets of the hotel, and came to find Athos, who had just received this information when his friends returned. All their countenances were melancholy and gloomy, even the mild countenance of Aramis. "'What is to be done?' asked D'Artagnan. "'To wait,' replied Athos. Each retired to his own apartment. At eight o'clock in the evening, Athos ordered the horses to be saddled, and Lord de Winter and his friends notified that they must prepare for the expedition. In an instant, all five were ready. Each examined his arms and put them in order. Athos came down last, and found D'Artagnan already on horseback and growing impatient. "'Patience!' cried Athos. "'One of our party is still wanting.' The four horsemen looked round them with astonishment, for they sought vainly in their minds to know who this other person could be. At this moment Planchet brought out Athos's horse. The musketeer leaped lightly into the saddle. "'Wait for me,' cried he. "'I will soon be back.' And he set off at a gallop. In a quarter of an hour he returned, accompanied by a tall man, masked and wrapped in a large red cloak. Lord de Winter and the three musketeers looked at one another inquiringly. Neither could give the others any information, for all were ignorant who this man could be. Nevertheless, they felt convinced that all was as it should be, as it was done by the order of Athos. At nine o'clock, guided by Planchet, the little cavalcade set out, taking the route the carriage had taken. It was a melancholy sight, that of these six men, traveling in silence, each plunged in his own thoughts, sad as despair, gloomy as chastisement. End of chapter 64 Poor Constance. I mean, just... I really did like her. And I liked her a lot because, and I know this is going to sound funny, since she was married to somebody else, but she didn't pick him. She didn't love him. He was just a scoundrel and a loser and he was just he wasn't worthy of her and her spine she was much much braver and more solid ethically than her husband and so having her be named constance even though she is inconstant with her actual marital husband 
she is absolutely constant in her love and devotion to love of and devotion to d'artagnan and constant in her trust and i know it's what got her killed but i love the fact that she was always looking for the best in people that she always wanted to be able to trust people and for the most part it worked out well for her she was working for the queen she was loved she was protected if not by her husband then at least by d'artagnan she totally did not deserve what happened to her i thought her death scene was heartbreaking it was very socrates like in some ways the the kind of i can't feel my legs but i thought there were some other interesting things going on in here as well when milady realizes who is arriving that she is going to be caught she groans i believe the line in the chapter is she groaned seeing d'artagnan and my question is this i do not have the answer to this did she groan because she saw d'artagnan and knew she would have to kill constance or was she simply playing the part groan the cardinal's men are here to take you lying to constance i don't know i don't know but i don't think dumas put that line in on accident she is not somebody who hems and haws or groans or or gets overly dramatic about things uh, generally especially when she's in control of the situation so i just it struck me as one of those kind of pivotal moments where characterization wise i don't know i don't know if she was just oh dear darling we have to get you to air quotes safety here drink this or if she really was oh god now i've got to kill her because she was planning on running with constance constance was going to be very useful for her in the long run so she didn't want to kill her at the beginning but i don't know i am sure that you also heard athos's line women weep men avenge and i thought that's very interesting again very interesting for dumas to put that in this chapter because milady does not weep she avenges and for athos to have made that statement i just thought that was very very interesting i also am sure you figured out who the man in the red cloak is the masked man i thought it was also a beautiful piece of characterization for dumas to write how athos went about finding the executioner that people he would ask directions and people would tremble and point or tremble and run away or just point and not talk to him and leave and finally finding this guy the guy's living alone doesn't have any servants is way into taxidermy and things like that the natural science victor frankenstein side of things and i found that fascinating too because there's a this is kind of a trigger warning for gruesome things so you can just stop right now if you don't want to listen to this but i know i've talked before a long time ago about how anne boleyn when i was at ucla in my history class where we did the wars of the roses our professor told us that anne boleyn had very very wisely requested a french long swordsman to be brought in to behead her and she did this for two reasons she knew it was going to take up to two weeks for the long swordsman to get there and she was hoping she could stall long enough to get henry to change his mind but also because head choppers and those big old axes they are big and they are heavy but that also makes them kind of clumsy and chopping off heads wasn't such an exact science it's why the guillotine was supposed to be such a, a modern innovation it was quick it was fast it was foolproof you were not going to suffer you, I mean, you were going to have your head chopped off sure but it wasn't going to be two or three or four blows with an axe that did it 
Same thing with the French long swordsmen. They knew what they were doing. They could take much more careful aim. Long swords are very heavy and they never needed two chances to get somebody's head off. Ew. Knowing all of that, I found it very appropriate seems the wrong word, but I guess appropriate that this guy who is an executioner has also made a study of anatomy. Like he's one of the careful ones. He's not going to accidentally hit your shoulders and cause you a lot of pain. He is going to know where to aim to do his job most efficiently. And not just efficiently, but the care that he's taking with like reconstructing skeletons and things like that in his own home also makes me think that he's, that it's a weird kind of thing. It's like a weird reverence for life. It's just not necessarily living life. Does that make sense? I don't know if that makes any sense. But I, I just found his his whole chapter to be surprising and oddly touching. He's such a you know an enormous outcast, but also very needed position in town. I mean, not necessarily in town. It's not like every town had somebody who could do this. But yeah, it's kind of a lot. So next week will be our final episode of The Three Musketeers. Depending on what kind of comments we get or voicemails or things like that, we will compile comments into a post book episode because I know not everybody listens in real time. So things that you might have wanted to say, you didn't really have a chance to IRL in, in real life in real time. So if you have something you want to share with everybody, please don't hesitate to call. You can call through the app on the contact. You can call 206-350-1642, or you can write to heather at craftlit.com and share your thoughts, and we can read them on a little follow-up episode if you have things to say. All right. <sighs> Heading into the final stretch. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. If you like what we do here, please consider liking and subscribing on iTunes, thumbs upping and subscribing on YouTube. You can visit patreon.com slash craftlit and become a patron of this art. And you can always go to Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash craftlit channel. And from there, you can get links out to all of the social media, all of the places that craftlit lives. It's it's a nice hub that you can go to to get all the stuff, all the good stuff. And I keep forgetting to mention, we also have a Facebook group with the loveliest group of people, as you might imagine. They're just awesome, makers and readers. And people who hadn't been readers before, but are now. I like that. All right, you take care of yourself. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.